Vikes Now, Dustin Baker, the final episode in March. It's March 31st, the Thursday edition, and we're here to talk about Patrick Peterson, him re-signing with the Vikings, and what that means. So first and foremost, on this topic, you have to ask why does this man want to be with the Vikings? He came, allegedly came in 2021 for Zimmer, you know, the defensive whisperer. Didn't work out for the Enterprise. Peterson played pretty good. We'll get into that. But it's you have to wonder, what does he see in this team, a, a former All-Pro, multiple-time All-Pro cornerback who presumably would want to win a Super Bowl? Why does he want to play here? Well, he, he told you so as such in his podcast yesterday. He considers the roster stacked. Now, I know many of you don't believe that, and we haven't even had the NFL draft yet. The roster is not a finished product. But the player is telling you this roster is it. It can contend. And it aligns with what the ownership has said since January 10th when they terminated Rick Spielman and Mike Zimmer that this football team has a roster to get into January meaningful football games. So what I want you to do is I know there's a lot of you watching and a lot of you in social media and at your houses in Minnesota and the Midwest that don't think that these Vikings are very good. And I think that the ownership and general management is banking on the fact that a coach is going to change it. So what our most recent vision of these Vikings is the Zimmer led Vikings going eight and nine with a roster that most of us knew wasn't terribly deep, but it had star studded players to at least contend for the division and maybe sneak into the wild card. It didn't happen. So you kind of have to pretend, try this little exercise with me, pretend like this roster, everything you know about it, the quarterback, the running back, the wide receivers, the defense, Darius Smith came along. You have to pretend that Sean McVay is going to coach it. Then how do you feel? And the only reason I'm saying that is because Kevin O'Connell is coming from the McVay tree to coach football in Minnesota. Now, he may not be as good as McVay. He might be better. He might be horrible. Who knows? Uh, but I think you have to suspend your belief um, to understand when Peterson, Patrick Peterson, says the roster is stacked. He believes it. And with a new head coach, you kind of have to pretend that we're going to get either McVay-ish tendencies or mcvay light. Um, and subtract Mike Zimmer from your mind because it's, I'm the sure as shit that's what the ownership and general management is doing. Otherwise, they would have made a lot more roster moves via trade, not retaining dudes. So get that out of the way. Patrick Peterson chose the Vikings because he likes the roster. If you don't like that, that's tough. That's, that's what was his decision. So go with that. Suddenly, uh, the 2022 Vikings and arguably some of the 2021 Vikings have a bunch of leadership guys. I, some of you may know I do a podcast every Wednesday with Brian McKinney, Sally from Minneapolis, and Ron Saw. And when the 2020 season was starting to go down the tubes, they had a nice little hurrah when they beat the Packers. Dalvin scored four touchdowns. And they were never really eliminated until later on. What was it Tampa game? No, it was later than that, the Bears game or something like that. Anyhow, on our show then, McKinney always pointed out uh, you know, who is the leader on this team? And I'd say, well, Dalvin just scored four touchdowns in Green Bay, maybe him. But at that point, there was no Everson Griffin. Harrison Smith's a quiet leader. We know um, very out there in the open that Cousins is a quiet leader. And so McKinney said that. I don't think this team has a leader. Well, you flash forward to now on the roster, Dalvin's still a leader. All of a sudden, Patrick Peterson is back. Zadarius Smith is boisterous. You still have the quiet leaders in Cousins and uh, Harrison Smith. Eric Kendricks is in the middle. Justin Jefferson is coming into his own. And then the almighty part on Cousins, whether or not he becomes himself with an offensive-minded head coach that he gets along with, unlike allegedly he and Zimmer couldn't coexist. So there's all of a sudden, especially with Peterson's uh, resumption in Minnesota, you have all of these leadership guys. When two years ago... All you had was the, the strong, silent types, you know, like Tony Soprano always talked about. So leadership dudes in the house, there's like six of them. Jordan Hicks, too, I didn't even mention him. He was considered the heart and soul of the Cardinals' defense by some accounts. And bada bing, now he plays with uh, the Vikings. That's number two. That is the leadership influx that Peterson brings once again to the 2022 Vikings. He's also cheap. This deal that he signed was one year, $4 million. Now, I will admit, uh, on behalf of Vikings territory, that I was incorrect. Uh, at the, when the season offseason started, I thought Peterson would be back. He said it five times to multiple people that I want to come back. But then Quasi Adafa Mensah would get in front of him, might give his value speech, 
And then you really, you never really knew, like, is he, is this guy actually going to come back or not? And then when they signed Chan and Sullivan, it felt like those dollars were allocated elsewhere and that Patrick Peterson would go join the Cowboys or Chiefs or Bears, whoever else was on a short list. We were wrong. He, he can, and I, I think I prognosticated that for about a week and a half, that he probably ain't coming back, just like I'm saying about Anthony Barr now. Incorrect. He came back one year, four million. A deal up to four million with incentives. And for an all-pro cornerback from yesteryear, You've got that that pedigree, that leadership pedigree that he can help uh, with the maturation process of Dantzler, the rookie that they probably draft four weeks from yesterday. Um, yes, or four weeks from today, excuse me. They're going to draft the cornerback high in the draft, and Peterson will be there to nurture. So uh, he's cheap, and he's a leadership dude. So th- those will keep those ones in your back pocket. Now, this next one is debatable. Uh, I perceived Peterson as a good cornerback last year. Uh, I think he had a 63-something Pro football focus score had a 78.7 pass rating against, which is very good, and he was targeted heavily. He missed four games, which, by the way, was the first time in his career he missed any time to injury. He was suspended a few years ago for PEDs or something. Uh, I think that's right. If it's not, I apologize. But he was suspended to start one of those seasons with the Cardinals. I didn't care because he didn't wear purple clothes. But last year uh, was his first bout with injury. The guy was 30. Now he's uh, no, now he's 31, going to be 32. That shit happens. Um, but he was good. He was consistent. Dantzler couldn't get out of the doghouse for, what, three weeks or a month? <laughs> Supposed to play special teams to earn his keep. And then the other dude sucked. Uh, Breland was never any good. I mean, he showed a glimpse of not being terrible for a little bit. And then he popped off and got fired and tweeted weird stuff. Kenzie Alexander was good for a little bit. Then he became quickly... PFF's worst cornerback in the world, which was bizarre. So I perceive Peterson as good. I th- I'm going to give you this little speech that I've given before. I don't know if I've given it on a podcast, but consider what you know about Patrick Peterson. He was an all-pro cornerback multiple times with the Cardinals. Now follow me here. Let's pretend LeBron James, my favorite basketball player, I like him like I do the Vikings. We are so used to LeBron being so dominant that it's like, oh, yeah. LeBron had 27-7-7. But pretend for a minute that all of a sudden, you never heard of, first of all, you never heard of LeBron. All of a sudden, there's a guy in London or a guy in Rwanda or a guy in Uzbekistan that's coming to the NBA. He's going to shake things up. You start to see dribblings about it on SI.com, Bleacher Report. Yeah, that's this dude, and he's going to come. And he, he, you should see him. He's going to be awesome. He shows up in the United States, and like clockwork, he starts banking 27 points per game, 7 rebounds, and 7 assists. And you'd never seen it before. The guy would win multiple MVP awards back to back to back to back. That's LeBron's stat line, and he's been doing this for, what is it, 18 years, and we're so accustomed to him being good that it doesn't even register anymore. In fact, when he has 24 points, 5 assists, 5 rebounds, we're like, what a shitty night at the office for LeBron. Something's up. He's getting old. You know, his, his ankles bother him. We'll take that parable with Patrick Peterson. You're not getting the all-pro dude from the Cardinals. You're getting the 31 and 32-year-old version of Peterson from the Cardinals, who can still be good. Now, in theory, he could pop up, have one last hurrah, and do that all-pro stuff again. It's unlikely at this age, but it's also not impossible. So consider the your interpretation of him through the lens of his resume. He's not going to be the dude that he was when he's 27, but that doesn't mean he wasn't good. He just wasn't the Peterson that you remember, but he was still uh, damn good. It's kind of like there was a, a parable in a film from the 90s I think it was 96 uh Dante's Peak Uh, I don't know if you guys ever watched that movie with the volcano uh Pierce Brodden's character talks about how if you take a frog the reptile and you put it into a pot or a vat of boiling water the thing's gonna jump out instantly uh, but if you put the frog in there with room temperature water and turn the son of a bitch up to boiling gradually over a period of minutes, the thing will sit there and boil to death. And the uh, analogy there is you become so used to something, like with the poor frog, that um, it just happens. So with Patrick Peterson, you got used to this upper echelon cornerback, and now he's he's a good cornerback, not elite. So uh, I perceive him as a good 2021 performer and glad he's back. Now, uh, he adds instant depth to the CB room. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. We were panicking. We had Cameron Dantzler and Harrison Hand. That was, what, a week and a half ago, two weeks ago? What are they going to do? Don't Have they not got to that section on the depth chart yet? When are they going to address it? 
Well, of course, no, we, we just need the patience, like we do a lot of times in this digital world. And they signed Janet Sullivan to play slot. And all of a sudden, with Peterson back, a dude who is consistent, who's usually healthy, you don't have to panic anymore about the depth chart for cornerbacks for these Minnesota Vikings. It's still not elite, Dantzler, Peterson, and the boys. Thankfully, the NFC North's wide receiving core is diminished now, so there isn't quite as a you know urgency needed, but you're going to have to play a lot of teams besides the, the Packers, Bears, and Lions, who are almost receiverless through March 31st. But he adds instant depth. So if instant, excuse me, if you're looking at the depth chart thinking, oh, God, that's what we were doing a week and a half ago with the cornerbacks. You don't have to do that anymore. They're there, and they're probably going to draft one, and that's, that's the next thing. The draft implication of this shouldn't change one iota. The team needs to set itself up for long-term success at cornerback. Signing Patrick Peterson for an extra year does not do that. That is a stopgap to get you to contendership because they perceive that they are Super Bowl contenders. Peterson adds depth to the, the roster, and that's it. For one season, can't bank on it anymore. Maybe he'll be back after this. We shall see. So the only smidgen of relief, if you were looking for it on draft night, is that, in theory, if Adolfo Mensa wanted to trade back, which I'm starting to warm up to the idea with his speeches on value, then he could probably get a second rounder if he slid back six to eight spots, and then also draft Trent McDuffie or Elam Dude or Andrew Booth. Now, I don't know his thought process. You don't either because the dude's brand new. It doesn't have a, a resume of the guy GM leadership. But it gives you a little wiggle room that, indeed, they still need a corner because they have to plan for the future uh, to have a partner for Dantzler. And I believe they could now reasonably trade back and take a cornerback in the first or second round. But make no mistake, it doesn't change what they need uh, because you can still probably get the best player available with all of these corners that are marinating in the draft class. Um, But it gives you a little less peace of mind. I don't think Quazy would have panic drafted a cornerback at number 12, but he doesn't even have to consider that now because they have a fieldable set of corners for the 2022 season. Whether or not they're great or good, uh, we shall see. But you're going to have an enhancement of a rookie like Stingley or Sauce or McDuffie or Booth or Elam. There's a bunch of them, whether that is in the first round or second round. So just because they have Peterson doesn't mean that you know they're set at corner. Um, it gives them wiggle room to get the best player available, and they probably still find a cornerback in the first two rounds. Winding down for the afternoon. As a, a mini Vikings historian, I can say that when a top name comes to the Vikings via free agency or sometimes trade, it's a lot cooler when the guy stays for longer than one year. Uh, when you look back at the annals of free agency, um, Antoine Winfield name is screamed because he came from the Bills, so did Pat Williams, and they stayed here for a long time. If Peterson, uh, Patrick Peterson would have come here for one year and then went to the Cowboys, you'd remember it, but you would because you're obsessed with the team. Like uh, John at the grocery store wouldn't give a shit that he played for the team uh, for one year. So I think it adds some... I don't know, legitimacy to his decision to come here last year, or at least shows that this was a cool destination to come uh, come to. Two years of a perhaps Hall of Famer is better than one. And when you reflect back on, oh, remember that time that Patrick Peterson came to the Vikings? It would feel like an accident if it was one year. Now that he's back for two years, it's like, well, yeah, we'll get in the playoffs this time. We'll give the guy something to remember. And finally, he said on the All Things Pup Covered podcast, he wants to play for three more years. And one of that will be in purple and yellow clothes. So if this thing goes well you can have Peterson finish out the second chapter of his career with the Vikings after an illustrious uh, long stay with the Cardinals. And that's pretty cool, especially if you follow this stuff from, I've been doing it for 26 years. A lot of you have been doing it for 50, maybe the whole time uh, you've experienced the the purple-related heartbreak. But the idea that he's willing to play three more years, and if indeed this Kevin O'Connell experiment partnered with Kirk Cousins and Quazy, the the, uh, the the multiple, the, the K, the Kirk, the Kevin, the Quazy, um, then it's going to heighten his pros- prospect of staying here longer. And 
he's, he's a damn good defender that even when he's 33 and 34, there's a place for him. Look at Richard Sherman. He's still pretty productive when he's healthy, and he's the same type of uh, leadership dude. Maybe a little bit more rough around the edges, at least for the off-the-field stuff. But consider this an audition. If you're a Patrick Peterson fan, this is a sequel to two more years after this because that's how long he has to play, and it could conceivably be with the Vikings. That's the Thursday edition. I think on the whole, you can be optimistic about Peterson coming, if only for the depth chart purposes. Uh, if you're in team rebuild, then this one probably didn't uh, move the needle, but this show really isn't a team rebuild show if you haven't caught on. All we got for Thursday, we'll be back Friday, and skull, baby.